Okay, my name is Kevin Gallagher. Um, I'm a writer, musician, and Linux system administrator. And I'm also involved with the Mass Pirate Party and activism on issues related to um, information freedom, privacy, surveillance state, stuff like that. And right now, I'm going to be talking to you about TripIt, which is a software that you can use to encrypt your files. Uh, it's been around for a while. It's very user friendly and it has a client available for all platforms. So if you don't have TripIt already, I would encourage you right now to go, the people who have computers, to go to uh, TripIt.org and download it for your system. Um, on TripIt.org, they have installers for Windows, Macs, and Linux. Um, it's a graphical application. It looks and works the same on all platforms. So, once you get it installed and you run TrueCrypt, this is what you're going to see. The basic concept is you're going to create uh, file containers, which basically um, it's a file that contains a file system within it that you can put your files in and they'll be encrypted and secure. Um, and an interface refers to them as volumes. Earlier I had set one up called Crypto Party, but I'm going to do a new volume. So, the volume creation wizard. There's an option here where Tripper has a functionality to encrypt within a whole partitioner drive, but we're not going to do that. It's a little more complicated. Um, we're going to create an encrypted file container. Next. Uh, it can be standard or it can be hidden. The hidden mode is intended for you, is intended uh, for deniability of uh, the file even being there. So the hidden uh, trigger container, um, you won't be able to see it unless you have the password. So we're going to do a standard TrueCrypt volume, and we're going to call it uh, Crypto Party 2, or Crypto Party 3. Um, as it says here, a TrueCrypt volume can reside in a file, which can reside on a hard disk, or used to be a flash drive. It's just like a normal file. Um, if you select an existing file, it won't encrypt it, it's going to create a new container that replaces it. So go ahead and do that. And here we have our encryption options. You can choose the algorithm with which you want to encrypt. Some are uh, either more secure or faster than others. But the default is AES, which is pretty good. Uh, and as you see, you can get more information on it. This is AES uh, 256 which is um, a pretty good and recent, well, just from 1998 encryption standard. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and click next. Here's where you uh, specify the volume size. And um, so let's say I'm going to have a or 10 megabyte TrueCrypt volume. You go ahead and you're going to create a password for your TrueCrypt volume. So, um, the password I'll use is crypto party. Confirm it. Um, definitely good practice would not to be using a password that's that simple. Typically, you want special characters, uh, lowercase, uppercase, stuff like that. Um, it's key files option. Not really sure what that does, but I think it provides more. Um, more uh, randomization into how you encrypt your volume. So, next. Warning, short passwords are usually correct. They're recommending a password of more than 20 characters, which, in my opinion, um, that would be pretty hard to remember. You'd have to write it down somewhere if you wanted to do that. But I'm going to say yes. Here's where you choose the file system type. Um, FAT is an old um, 
follow system standard, and it works for our purposes, and we'll go ahead and click next. Here's where it's uh, it needs a random seed to um, to create the keys it's going to encrypt with. So it's telling me to move my mouse as randomly as possible. Uh, the longer you move it, the better. It increases the cryptographic strength because um, it uses this randomization to create a more secure seed with which to encrypt the volume. So we'll go ahead and format. Volume has successfully been created. And it's created and ready for use. Um, okay. So now there's a file on my system called Crypto Party 3. It looks like any other file, and, but actually it's a trickery contain, container. Um, so what I can do here is select file, Crypto Party 3, open it up, and then I want to mount it. And when you mount it, it's going to ask for the password that uh, we created earlier. So, crypto party. It's taking a second to uh, decrypt the information. And now we have a mounted volume that functions as basically as a folder. If I double click this, uh, here on Mac, it's basically a folder here. I could drag and drop files into it. Um, and so what we'll do is I have a copy of the Crypto Party Flyer. I have the flyer in JPG. Um, and I have some notes in text format. And so I'll just put a few files in there. And I close that, and those are in the container. Now I can dismount it. And as I was saying, Crypto Party 3, it's right here. Looks like any other file. You can't tell that it's uh, that it contains uh, these other files that are encrypted. Um, so this is a really good tool. Um, for keeping the information secure. So, um, what do you want to put in there? If I want to read it back, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna select it again, mount it, do the password. And there we go, the files are there. So, um, the true con container, as I was saying, it's a regular file, you can copy it anywhere, and um, it can be read with any TrueCrypt installation you've got. I have some virtual machines here with, uh, this is Linux, um, and the GUI is the same. So I could copy that file into Linux, and it would look exactly the same, and those files within a container would be accessible, as long as you have the password. Um, same thing on Windows. Looks exactly the same. So, does anyone have any questions about TrueCrypt using it? Um, is there a command line option to use it? I don't think so. It's mostly a graphical application. And is it open source? Um, I think it's proprietary. Yeah. It's open source. Oh, is it? Donations. It's not GPL. Yeah, they ask for donations for it. Let's see here. Yeah, it's, it's free open source software. My mistake. Anything else? Okay. Um, is FAT the only file system you can choose? Nope. Um, I mean, they're listed FAT and Mac OS extended, but on Windows, will it show NTFS? Right. Or it, it just Look, let's see. It just showed me NTFS on the Windows version. Right. Will it not be able to read NTFS on a on a Mac installation? If you choose an oh. I'm not sure on that actually. Um, I think TrueCrypt. Ideally, it would have 
I would have the capability to read it within, but I'm not. I'm honestly not sure. Um, I would think we could get it in the past. You could test it best to be readable on Linux. Yeah, there's on Jeff Hardy. You can get three on Windows. Non-starter, as far as I can tell. So no, there, there's there's a few there's some software out there that will let read a extended file system version three and four on Windows. Um, you just have to search for it. Uh, I use it at home. I think it's called uh, X Volume Manager. Um, basically, basically works as a Windows driver. So that's TrueCrypt. It's a very useful tool for uh, you know activists or um, sensitive information that you would like to keep private. Um, and the only thing about it is that password. So there's this thing called rubber hose crypt analysis. The concept here is that uh, you're only as secure as your password. So someone could torture you for your password, theoretically. And um, this is routinely done. So uh, Julian Assange actually invented a, back in the late 90s, he came up with a file system called uh, Rubber Hose before he uh, was into WikiLeaks, which is deniable encryption. And you can encrypt whole drives with this. Um, it was intended for activists in third world countries doing the sensitive information. And basically, if an authority came into contact with the drive, it would just look like random stuff, and they wouldn't know what to do with it. Uh, so, the other thing is uh, Lux, which is Linux Unified Key Setup. Uh, it works best with LVM, which is the Logical Volume Manager, and uh, it has a command line tool called Crypt Setup, which you use to set it up um, on Linux. And this is typically used for full drive encryption, or um, you can you can do it on specific folders too. But it's a little more complicated and difficult to explain, so I'm not going to get into it for this presentation, except to demonstrate uh, what it would look like to have a, uh, once you have a, a Lux system, when you boot it up. So here I have Debian. I have Lux already set up on it. And it's booting. Grub. Now, I can't get in without the passphrase. Once I enter it, it can mount and read the um, Lux volumes. And then the system will boot. So that's another alternative. I know there's also, um, let's see, on other options. On Windows, there's a uh, Discryptor, which is uh, a third party software, and there's BitLocker, which I think comes on newer versions of Windows. On Mac OS X, you have Fireball, which you can go into your system preferences here. It downloads all the relays and it goes through and authenticates everyone to make sure they're actually going to release. It's the same idea that I'm there. And then you're a Okay. And go to uh, security and privacy. This is on. This is available in the new versions of OS X. Firewall secures the data on your disk by encrypting its contents automatically. So um, I could turn that on, and the full disk would be encrypted. On boot, you would need to enter the password um, in order to get it. So that's all for that. Are there any questions? All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about off the record messaging, OTR, which is a very convenient um, scheme for sending secure 
This is messy. Yes. Uh, what's your act? The good thing is, it works across all IAM protocols. Like, you can use it with Yahoo, with Jabber, with AIM, with um, whatever you got, basically. And um, so, I would encourage you all to get this set up. The links are right here. The options for Windows are Miranda. Um, you have to get the Mirror OTR plugin. On um, Mac, it's Adium or Adium. The thing with this computer stuff is it's always pronounced differently depending on who you talk to. But uh, let's say in a uh, Adium, I want to talk to somebody. It's built in. It's a Mac uh, instant messaging client. Uh, so I can initiate a crypto to your chat. It doesn't require a plugin. Um, you go to this link here, cypherpunks.ca.otr, has all the information. No one else can read your instant messages. You're assured the correspondent is who you think it is, and the messages are deniable. It means no one knows that you're even having a conversation. Um, they have an installer for Windows, and they have the plugin for uh, Linux. So basically, on Linux, you want to install the package Fusion OTR. Um, if anyone wants to do this, I'm going to do a demonstration with Jabber, XMPP. And I have a account set up, CryptoParty at Jabber.org. And you can send me a message there. So you go to register.jabber.org to set up a new account. But, um, all right. I have Windows virtual machine here with two instant messaging clients. Here's Miranda with a mirror, mirror RTR plugin. It's right there in the preferences. Um, it uses the concept of fing unique fingerprints, uh, cryptographic. And here we have Pigeon. Uh, in order to enable it in Pigeon, you have to go to plugins, off the record messaging. Provides private and secure conversations. Configuration with known fingerprints, and you can require it, which is a good thing to do. But uh, so I'm gonna try to demonstrate this. I have two users, OTR guy and Crypto Party. On Miranda, I'm OTR guy, and on Pigeon, I am Crypto Party at Jerry Rowe. So um. Crypto party wants to talk to OTR guy. Right now, it's a non-secure conversation. Let me say, hey. Whoops. We did this earlier, so I have to end that. I'll say, hey. And there's a new message. And he's got it. Hello. All right. Now, um, since I required, asked to require encryption on Miranda, um, it's asking to authenticate for OTR. There's different ways you could authenticate. One of them is a challenge question, which would be like um, a, a question to, that you each know the answer to. And this is a way of making sure that the person you're talking to is who they really are. So um, I'll say, where are you? And the answer is somewhere. Now this is not necessary. I could do it manually, or I could do a known password. Um, but it's just one way of verifying. So authenticating contact. Now on the other client pops up a secret question. Authenticating a body helps ensure the person you're talking to is who she claims to be. Um, I'm in mean, Secret answer. Authenticate. Um, no, we're just talking about OTR. So, authentication successful on both ends. Now you see, um, right here, it's unverified. Down here, OTR is set up. Um, this unverified means that I haven't authenticated the uh, crypto party yet. So, I'm going to do that. 
then I can just do that manually. Now, the idea there is um, the, the fingerprints that are generated, unique fingerprint that's used, um, you want to make sure it matches the other person. Um, I can skip that and just say that I had verified that it is the correct fingerprint. It's in a cave. Now in Pigeon, the conversation shows it pro as private. Now using a verified fingerprint. Okay, we're sending messages back and forth. If anyone else wants to send me a message, we can test with TR if you've got it set up. Uh, any questions about authentic messaging? Nope. Okay. Um, another thing I would like to talk about is secure um, voice and video calls. So, don't use Skype. Download this client called Jitsi. It's uh, another free open source, it's basically a Skype alternative. It has a lot of great features. Um, let's see. So you go to jitsi.org. Again, they have it available for uh, all your common platforms. And um, in order to use this, the best way to go is you need a SIP or uh, SFP uh, account. And sip to sipinfo gives you a free one. There's other providers that um, are paid that provide this, but um, you can just use sip to sip I've already created one called uh, Crypto Party at sip to sip info So I can log in there. And earlier, we had a demonstration where I was talking to uh, this guy. And my devices, it shows I'm using Jitsi. So here's Jitsi. Um, this guy's online. Or not online. Is there anyone with Jitsi installed? I know there's someone who's supposed to help me. Okay. So it depends on how quickly Tor can download Jitsi. Oh, you're doing everything over Tor? Oh, no, but I learned how to do it. Yeah. I don't have to okay. download it offline. We were supposed to have someone in this room who was going to call me so I could demonstrate. Um, I'm assuming the mic on this thing works. Yeah. I've had the trouble with that. Let me know if you can get it up fast. But anyway, uh, sit. Um, it allows you to use these uh, voice and uh, video encryption protocols, like SRTP and uh, ZRTP. Um, so using this Jitsi client, I could also put some chat. Uh, you can use it on. Um, it's also compatible with all this stuff like AIM, ICQ, Windows Live Messenger, Yahoo Messenger. It has all these features. So um, Skype is really not good. I'm pretty sure they log everything. And Jitsi is a great alternative. Um, Don't those services also log? No. Well, I don't know. If you're using OTR, it's really up to you whether you want to um, log your conversations locally. You know what I mean? No, I'm saying it doesn't aim these these other services that Jitsi is using. I would. Oh, I would assume that they do, except um, Jitsi uh, also supports OTR. So even if they were, they wouldn't be able to read it. Uh, any questions about using Jitsi? So this SIP thing, secure voice over IP, you could also get a client on your Android 
for your iPhone. Uh, I use SipDroid or CSIP Simple. Um, once you've made that account at sip to sip info you can set that up and you have secure uh, VoIP calls. Um, free from uh, surveillance and intrusion. Um, one more question. Is that more like peer or is that a Google? Jitsi is not peer to peer. Just to make the initial call. Well, it depends on what um, what protocol you're using. It's it's direct. It does voice over fee. It'll it'll it's, it'll be a direct. It'll go through the internet and be a direct TCP or UDP. Typically UDP. I guess once you load the program, I'll advertise where you are. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't believe so. Yeah. I was wondering if I would like to call you. How to reach? Oh, you would add me as a contact within Jitsi. So my address is CryptoParty at sip2sip.info. Um, add contact right here. Um, and there's, like I was saying, there's different SIP providers. So, but then in order for him to know that you are online, yeah. there would be a server somewhere that says this person is online right now, that then that you advertise to. It would be the SIP provider, yeah. So, yeah, sip to sip, right. So if somebody were to subpoena sip to sip, they could get that you had this telephone call, but not the contents. The contents of this call. Uh, yeah, maybe. There's a lot of uh, options in here um, for this particular provider, um, including voicemail and stuff like that. For this particular provider? Um, so you can go to a particular provider yep. and get prepaid charge for your cameras. Yeah, so there's different SIP providers. Exactly. Is it the same as VPNs you have to pay for? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, some are only. There's a lot of good people out there who will only provide logs with a uh, court order. You know, others will give them up to law enforcement at the drop of a hat. Um, you just gotta choose wisely what you use. So um, that's it. For my next thing, I would like to advocate the use of an alternative currency project called Bitcoin. This is an open source experimental digital alternative currency using cryptographic hashes. It's totally peer-to-peer. -to -peer. There's no central network to it. And uh, the issuance of money is carried out collectively. It enables instant payments to anyone, anywhere in the world. There's clients available for uh, Mac, Linux, and Windows. Bitcoin um, has been, become more popular in the last two years. It started in two, late 2009, 2010. Um, the value of it has gone up and down. Um, there's been a few incidences with uh, hacking of servers with Bitcoins on them that were compromised and the victims were stolen. But actually the core software is solid. Solid as hell. So um, Bitcoin, in my opinion, it's really a great way to get around the, uh, the banks the, um, and you know all the tracking of electronic payments and PayPal, stuff like that. Because we know that PayPal has not the best business policies. Um, so a Bitcoin client, when you load it up, Oh, a couple more things about Jitsi. In the preferences for Jitsi, you can have these different uh, SIP accounts. 
Uh, you can log your chat history. You can choose your devices, your video devices. There I am. Now there's security. Jitsi will automatically try to secure all your calls, and you will both hear and see a notification once the secure connection is established. It shows up as a little lock icon. If the lock is unlocked, then it's not secure. If it's locked, then you know it's secure. There's some uh, additional settings here for uh, people who know what they're doing to select what kind of uh, encryption you're using on Jitsi. Yeah, I'm going to try to quit Bitcoin and restart. So how much does the value of Bitcoin relative to the U.S. dollar fluctuate? Okay. I remember hearing you use the value of the real dollar. Yes. In June of um, 2011, it was $30 for one Bitcoin, and it crashed. So early adopters had an advantage because um, they had more more bitcoins, and as people came in, the the value went up. Mm -hmm. So, but currently, the value of bitcoins is uh, thirteen dollars, and that's actually increased from like three dollars in January of this year. So, if you had bought bitcoins at three dollars, um, you would have tripled or uh, quadrupled your money to buy it. Um, there's a lot of people who speculate on the Bitcoin market and stuff like that. Um, you can trade them. There's people who will buy them for PayPal. But if you're interested in this, go to Bitcoin.org. Uh, you want to get it on RFC, you can go to Freenode, uh, sorry, Freenode, and go to the Bitcoin channel. There's also a web of trust that incorporates GPG to verify identities and reputations for people who are trading their points. <laughs> um, okay, so the last thing I want to do is try to run a client again. Um, claim Bitcoin for more private than banks. What about just purchase going to Target or whatever and purchasing a prepaid credit card with cash? Well, the actual blockchain, which is the record of all transactions at this point, is completely public. So um, it's not it's it's pseudo anonymous. Um, it uses addresses that are associated with a private key that you hold. Um, what's the scenario you're thinking? Of? You would just mention the transactions are private. Well. Bitcoin transactions are totally public. What I'm saying is, as far as your identity, uh, in, in that way it's private. But then, again, if, if I were to purchase just a prepaid credit card for cash. But wouldn't you have to give your name? I mean, if you're going to use a credit card, usually a name is attached to that, right? Yeah. Or like the, well, the American Express like gift cards that just have money on it. Oh. Well, using cash. Yeah, that would be anonymous. Okay. Using cash is good practice for you know, not one to um, but Bitcoin is it's experimental software. Definitely, it's not to a point yet. It's still in beta. It's not even at one point out. But um, I encourage people to try it out and see how it works for them. This is what the client looks like. Um, when you start it up, you generate an address. So this is my Bitcoin address right here. I can generate a new one. We'll call it, uh, oops. Yeah. It's a party, Boston. We're receiving address. Okay, so now I have this totally unique uh, Bitcoin address. And if you were to send me coins, that's where you'd send them to. And they would show up. And I could send coins. Right now, I have a wallet with zero in it. Everything, um, all your Bitcoins, their, your access to them is controlled through a wallet file. And there are services like uh, 
online, like I think Bit Instant and stuff like that, that provide an online wallet. I wouldn't recommend that. Also, the main exchange uh, is uh, markbox.com. This is where you exchange Bitcoins for US dollars. And you can also do a lot of things like there. Well, they were hacked a while ago. Mount Gox, they, yeah, they may have been compromised once. Um, well, there's a huge hack involving Bitcoinica, which was more of a, like, a, it was a different type of operation. It's really more uh, speculative. And uh, Bitcoinica was hacked, and a lot of people lost a lot of money. Like, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, when you're using this, you want to keep that file walloped up that secure. And within the client, there is an option here to encrypt your wallet. I can uh, encrypt it with a passphrase, general characters. Right. If you encrypt your wallet and lose your passphrase, you will lose all your bitcoins. Are you sure? Yes. This makes it a little more secure. But the point is, um, if someone were to gain access to your system, all they would have to do is copy that wallet at that, presuming it's not encrypted, and um, put it in their own Bitcoin, and they would have access to your money. So you want to keep that secure. And that's what's been behind the hacks. There's also been, um, there's been the development of uh, worms that or Trojans that specifically look for this file to steal it. And um, because the actual Bitcoin market is up to, I think, like 200 something million dollars at this point. So there's a lot of money involved. And um, there's also the aspect of Bitcoin called mining, which is running your graphics card GPU to uh, generate Bitcoins. I actually do this at home, and um, what it does is it does cryptographic hash calculations to try to determine the value of the next block, but also in the peer-to-peer -peer context, it works to secure the network um, and verify all the transactions. If there is no environment, then uh, the security of Bitcoin itself will go down pretty fast. Bitcoin as a distributed computing project, I think right now is either the first or the second most powerful um, in terms of processing power project in the world right now. Are there any questions about it? So mining actually gives you money in exchange for running large numbers of calculation on your graphics card that right. holds. Okay. And they use power. So your, your, your electricity bill factors in there too. Anything else? So that's how your bitcoins are introduced to your system. There's no central authority that you see that if people mine it. Right. I think that mining is just one way that they're introduced. Um, they're, they get created at a predetermined rate anyway, which is capped out at 23 million bitcoins, is the maximum that there ever will be. And um, the 23 million bitcoins. And, but bitcoins are divisible by like five decimal places, two. Um, so this is a guard against inflation. So it, it's protected against inflation and stuff like the Federal Reserve and what they do with uh, mm -hmm. their uh, quantitative easing. Exactly, quantitative QE. QE1, QE2, QE3, QE N plus 1. But it doesn't really matter because I also read that the, the top guys that created it own like 60% of all the bitcoins. Uh, that seems like an unsubstantiated rumor. Exactly. Well, However, the identity of they the guy show them, this basically. Satoshi Nakamoto is uh, someone who's completely anonymous. He published a paper right. specifying what Bitcoin was, and then he developed the first version of the client, and other people picked it up from there. But then he dropped out, and no one's heard from him, and no one actually knows who he is. Uh, there's speculation that this person is, he must have been an expert in both cryptography and 
financial markets. When he initiated the blockchain, the, the first message that uh, was signed into it was uh, a news story about the bank bailouts. So, bank what? The bailouts that happened in 2008, 2009. So, um, that kind of provides some insight into his motivations for creating it, I guess. But uh, otherwise, nobody knows who he is. So another problem might be a rumor that he is um, the guy who's high he has a pyramid in the back of the doll bill, right? <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, if anyone needs help getting set up using bitcoins, or actually, if you if you want to buy purchase any bitcoins because the value could go up in the future, um, then get in touch with me. Where do they come from? Where do they come from? Okay, so it's, as I was saying. The coins are minted at a predetermined rate, and um, there's 50 bitcoins per block. So I was referring to the blockchain, the record of all transactions. Every time a new block is created, there's 50 bitcoins in it. However, um, over time, this gets reduced. So um, at a predetermined time, it, it, it will go down to 25 bitcoins per block. Also, in the mining equation, the difficulty goes up and the reward goes down. So over time, people um, that are mining are going to be receiving less for the GPU power that they're going in, putting in. Any questions? Yeah. I just had a question about what it's for. Is it just on the market right now? Is it like the equivalent of a dollar? What's it worth on the market? Yeah. Um, the best source for that is uh, nuncops.com. And we'll go there right now and see where it's at. There are other exchanges out there. I think there's, yeah. there's, there's at least one site that looks at all of the exchange rates on yeah. like, different currencies and. This one is the most trusted. It says um, about 11 or so. Yep, so it's at, the average is $11.60. $11.60. Yeah. Um, Although about a year or two ago, it hit something like 30 plus dollars and then it crashed over this period of four months or so. Yeah. It's been going up since then, but okay. it's, it's, it's a little volatile. So there's, a site there's not a lot to buy with it, unfortunately. Yeah. There's a site here called uh, uh, Bitcoin Charts, Dirt, uh, BTC. This shows the fluctuation in the price. Um, it's also... All these different currencies, euros. It's about eight euros. We got uh, all those different countries' currencies, and there's a lot of people that, that trade in also. So, um, yeah. Okay, my contact information is Kevin at hspolis.net. This is my public uh, Bitcoin address, right here. And there's a site, as I was saying, all the transactions are public. Um, Kevin at what now? A-G-E-S-P-O-L-I-S, .net. A -G -E -I -S -P -O -L -I -S net. It's actually an Aether's Twin song from Slip to Daniel Works. A-G-E-I-S-P-O-L-I-S. Yep, and you can contact me for more information or if you want Bitcoins. So, on blockchain.info, I can enter in my address here, search, and this shows all the whole history of my transactions sent and received from this address. Uh, I've received 146 dot something Bitcoins. And, um, yeah, actually. Right, yeah. 
Um, so my mining gains go to this, and they go in intervals of 0.1. So you can see these ones that go 0.1, 0.1. Those are all mining gains. Um, there's different mining pools you can sign up for that people pooling your resources and GPUs um, and push out the rewards. From what I've read, it's about the same. It's about the same. Okay. Um, cost benefit analysis. Right. Um, it's going to require some time before you start seeing money in terms of your electricity costs. But there are people who set up, um, you know, mining uh, clusters that are like as big as like this whole table that have like hundreds of GPUs in them, and they make a lot of money. They do. It just take. It probably just takes a few months for them to start for the uh, electricity costs to be surmounted by the gains that are here in terms of Bitcoin. There's actually a, oops. So what's preventing someone with a lot of money like Microsoft or Google to make these huge server farms and start mining? Yeah. Like what's, what's stopping them from doing that? Well, it might be being done. I mean, uh, I mean, if that's the case, then I mean, the wealth of the Bitcoins is completely lopsided. Right, so they can start manipulating the price right. of the Bitcoin. Right now, the market is so small that actors with large amounts of Bitcoins can significantly influence the price. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a cycle of Bitcoin mining calculator. So if you have a graphics card uh, and you figure out the hash rate for it, I don't know, like mining hardware comparison. The best cards for it are Radeons, if you want to get into this. And um, it shows you the hash rate for all the different models. So, my card at home does about 140 mega hashes per second. And this pulls down the current difficulty and the current exchange rate. I calculate that. It comes out to a half dollar per day and $16.20 per month. That's what I make mine. And I don't mind the electricity or whatever because the computer is always on and running anyway. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Recorded will be available for later. Um, I'm not sure where you're gonna have to ask Jamie. The gentleman's been right next to you, actually. Yeah. Another good uh, practice I would recommend um, when you're browsing the internet, if you're not using Tor or whatever, you should actually set up your page as a uh, HTTPS encrypted Google.com. Google offers this uh, over SSL and encryption, and it makes your searches a little more secure. Yeah, everywhere. Mm. Yeah. Help with the usability of this, right? Is that a plugin? Well, I heard, oh, yeah, they were talking about it before, but yeah, the EFF a plugin that finds the right. versions. Yeah, you can down. You can, this is a plugin for Chrome and uh, Firefox. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the EFF is involved in finding. Major sites and companies that don't have SSL implemented, and trying to encourage them to get plugins EFF. No, the EFF.org is a website. One HTTPS is tripped everywhere. One of the sites that that they identified was OkCupid, which you know there's a lot of personal details on there, and they didn't have SSL for a time. Uh, I believe they have it now, which is good there. Um,
or something that doesn't uh, that, uh, so it takes away the filter bubble. Um, oh, yeah. duck, duck, go. Yeah. What? Self dripping. What? The uh, search engine. Yeah. Yeah. Duck, duck, go. Yeah, duck, duck, go. As opposed as a Google alternative. Oh, oh I know. Google, Google, Google stores information about yeah. what you what you search for. To yeah. To tailor searches. They do. But uh, Google search history. Can you log in here? Uh, or you can see your Google history. Information is too good. Uh, it looks like it's off now. But anyway, um, you can enable your Google search history or you can disable it. Huh. I don't know if they're gonna, they actually keep it either way, but uh, you know, it's helpful to if you want to keep your Google history or not. You can also liberate your data. Um, data liberation front. Huh? Yeah. I would go to your Google account and uh, data, oops, data liberation. This will let you download all your data. Facebook has the same feature. It includes uh, presumably everything that Google has on you. That you know, maybe there's some things that uh, they do have that are not included. But uh, you can get a copy of your data. Yeah, Facebook. Uh, has the same thing. Go into your account settings. Uh, security. Uh, download a copy of your Facebook data. It's so right here. You can get an archive of all the data that they have on you, except for this stuff. Um, yeah, let's see what's in. So anyway, my name is Kevin M. Gallagher. My Twitter handle is Aegis, A-G-E-I-S. I would encourage you to follow me. And that's that.